Hey everyone, I'm Nick from Shopify Plus. I'm a developer lead here in our Waterloo office. Today, I'd like to talk to you about building your backend for high volumes. So when we build apps, we try to solve problems. We, we dream of solving problems for, for customers, our merchants, and we try and make their lives easier. We try to make hard things simple, and we try and improve their lives. When we dream of these things, we, we don't often think that they're going to turn into nightmares. No one warns you that one day your wildly successful app will be your enemy. Success kills apps. Success is killing your app. Apps that don't have any users do not wake you up at night. Apps that have lots of passionate users will wake you up at night. The alarms will go off, your app is down, things are a problem. These large apps, as they're more and more successful, they start to require a lot more hand-holding. Often it feels like your app is on life support. This is a problem because these apps, they bleed money. They cost you a lot of money. They cost you money in hosting fees because you start scaling them up, trying to improve it. They cost you a lot of labor to fix them, to hold their hand, and they cost you in churn. You're losing your users. You're eroding trust with your users if your app is continually in a state of life support. Life support is okay in the short term. This is your app telling you that it needs some help. So what does a successful app look like when it's not bleeding money? Success is actually quite boring. If you're sitting around and if you're looking at metrics for your app, this is a great thing to see. This is like sitting around a campfire. You're sitting around Datadog, you're sitting around New Relic, and you're watching your beautiful, successful app, and it's boring. Nothing exciting is happening. These nice flat lines. These flat lines are healthy, they're, they're predictable, and predictable means that you can predict what the costs are going to be as your user base grows. When an app is on life support, however, these are not often as boring. You start to see situations like these ones. So here, the request time is in black, and the throughput is in purple. And this may be any app out there in the wild. And you know these two things on their own are, are not too big a deal, but together, I see a problem. I see request time that is disproportionate with the throughput. Throughput has increased, and request time has gone up much higher than it should have. This is smoke from a very distant fire. This is an app with bottlenecks that need to be identified and need to be fixed. Here we have another graph with the throughput of the application is purple again. And while it looks a little bit more exciting, there's these flat bits at the top. And when I see graphs like this, what I see is something called request queuing. Request queuing happens, and it puts requests in line after each other waiting for your app to catch up. This is supposed to help your app survive large spikes. But what happens with request queuing is requests take longer, they start timing out, and all these dropped requests and timed out requests start adding up to churn for you. It starts eroding trust with your users because your app can't compete and can't hold up to the demand that they're putting on it. We have a whole other bunch of fun things that we see from our apps. This is one that is always exciting and is just never really a great thing. If we see graphs like this, we have to assume that these apps are being over-provisioned to make sure that you can handle the peaks because they're just coming all the time. And when you're provisioning for the peaks, you're wasting a lot in the dips and it's, it's not a great property. But if these are a little bit familiar, that's okay, that's not a big deal. This is a temporary thing. This is your app being successful. You are suffering because of your success. And don't be embarrassed by your success. This is the goal. You wanted a successful app. You wanted to make lives pe people's lives better. And this is their report card telling you that you're doing a good job, that your app matters to them. It's also completely okay to be reactive to this. It's cool to wait for your app to be a little bit on fire before you start worrying about scaling it. The title of my talk, Building Your Backend for High Volumes, is not only unfortunate for the word selection and the order, but it's also, I regret it because it implies that scaling is a, a premeditated or a preventative thing. You don't pre-scale an app. It makes no sense at all. You wait for it to become successful, you see what works, and then you fix the things that you need to fix. So how does one achieve scale? One thing that's great to do, it feels really satisfying, is you, you grab, grab your team or you go by yourself and you go cruising through your code base and you start hunting dragons. You look for these things that are going to be huge wins, 50% reduction in request time. You brought your monthly cost down. You, ha you have zero downtime for even a little while. The hard part about dragon hunting is that sometimes they don't exist. How long do you let yourself or you let a team go before you pull them back 
and you look for a better way. Sometimes these big wins, after the first one or two, if they're there, they just, they just don't appear anymore. So there's, there's a better way, a much, much harder way to make your app better. It's to get 1% better every day. This is how we do it at Shopify. We, we watch. This is maintenance. This is watching your app, listening to the signals it's telling you, and as new bottlenecks are exposed, you fix them. This is maintenance. It's not as glorious as Dragon Hunty, but glory exists at the end of this quest. You march through your code, you, you find problems, you make things more efficient, you find your bottlenecks, and you, over time and with data, this accumulates to a huge win for your code base. The hardest part here is getting fired up. It's really hard to trudge day after day and make these improvements on your app. You need a quest log, you need Datadog or New Relic or even Google Sheets, anything you can get your hands on where you can measure things and get feedback that every day, week over week, you're winning and that you're making your app better and better and better. So how do you actually go about winning? You can't improve everything. You have to pick the right battle. So a service level objective is a characteristic, something that's measurable of your app. Your service level agreement is what you're gonna promise to your users. So SLOs, you wanna choose them right. Things like availability or throughput or the frequency or the response time. You have to pick the ones that are right for you. You have to ask yourself, what value is my app delivering? And what are the appropriate SLOs for my app to optimize? In Shopify, we have two very different battlefields. We have the storefront where things need to be very, very, very fast. Imagine an app that does live product recommendations. It needs to be very, very quick to return these recommendations or they miss the opportunity to make an impact on a purchase. And we also have the back office. So once a checkout has gone through, once an order has been created, we now want to manage that order. We want to figure out what the risk is. We want to capture fulfillment. We need to do all that bookkeeping. So imagine an app that's doing capture on fulfillment. These apps, Capture on Fulfillment versus Product Recommendation, they have very, very different properties. They have very different dragons, and there's gonna be different trudges to make them 1% better. Let's start with the storefront side. So imagine this Product Recommendation app. It's trying to deliver product recommendations as people are on product pages or cart pages and trying to help create better conversion for merchants. This is where you need to be very, very fast. You'll start to see Metrics like these come together. You'll start to see that the more people are coming, the longer your request times are. And regretfully, there's really no silver bullet here. One thing that is true, though, is that you will find your bottlenecks much quicker than you find solutions to fixing them. So get some metrics going. Get Datadog, New Relic, get some APM tools, something that helps you trace through your code and find these bottlenecks. If you can find the bottlenecks and disarm them one at a time, you're gonna do the 1% march and this app will get much better and better and eventually your throughput and request time won't be scaling independently. Here you have your victory, super exciting. Your team has worked hard and everything is great for your app. Now, you may never get here for some apps and that's okay. Some things are just really, really hard to, to manage these peaks. So there may be an interesting way to cheat. If you remember the request queuing example from earlier, here we have it again. And the interesting thing about request queuing is that request queuing can kind of accidentally save your app. Things get in line, they give your app a chance to, to catch up, chance to breathe. So in our product recommendation app, there might be something we can do to kind of set expectations with our users and create a slightly richer offering for everybody. Imagine that we decided our product recommendation app was here for everybody and that we wanted to deliver great product recommendations as quickly as possible. So we could decide to put together some tiered pricing that allows us to throttle requests on smaller plans and save them for larger plans so that you can get paid more money to spin up more servers, more resources to handle these larger spikes. And for your smaller user base, those who can't afford to pay the fees to support the larger machinery, you can throttle them and say, you get a thousand per minute don't worry, you're not gonna use these unless you get into large scale flash selling. So you're, you're good. And by doing this, it means that your whole portfolio of users can be a little bit more predictable and these spikes are not gonna happen as much. This app in this scenario is a shared tenant app and we don't want to allow one tenant to hog all the resources. This is a level fair playing ground for your user base. And if this is right for your app, this is a great way to consider cheating to make your 
app a little bit more predictable when it hits these moments of high volume. So over to the back office. Imagine your orders have arrived. Which apps land here? Let's go back to our capturing on fulfillment app. So when an order comes in, we wait to capture. We wait till it's been fulfilled and then we capture the funds. This may happen a minute later, this may happen a few days later. But imagine this app missed even half a percentage of all the orders. That would be a disaster. There would be no trust left with your users. In this case, I recommend cheating and exchange time for consistency. This is again about setting expectations with your users. Picking your battle, picking your SLO. We're gonna bat for 100% and we're gonna sacrifice time and responsiveness to do it. So we're gonna tell our users that our app will usually process most orders that have been fulfilled in about a second. Now, sometimes, because the internet's hard and slow, it might take up to 15 minutes to capture an order after it's been fulfilled. But we absolutely guarantee that every order will be captured within 60 minutes of fulfill, fulfillment. And when your user's expectations have been set properly, it allows you to have a little bit of breathing space. Because this is probably what your world looks like. If you're waiting for orders to be fulfilled and you're waiting on webhooks, this is what graphs you're gonna see. You're gonna see lots of spikes, you're gonna see things all over the place, you're gonna have lots of quiet, quiet time for your server where it's waiting for the next flood of orders to come in. So last year at Summit, there was a great talk called The Power Web Hooks by Kevin. And he goes into details on how you can take these web hooks and put them into a job queue and, and manage them at your own speed. And this is a great strategy. If you're not doing this and you're, you're starting to struggle with web hooks, absolutely go and do this. But if you're doing this and it's still not good enough for you, there's, there's actually a, a really great way to do this. So Mike Potter from Rewind about six or seven months ago, last fall, wrote a blog post on Medium about how at Rewind they took the webhook problem and spun it in a different direction. So he decided to just say, my app doesn't have to worry about webhooks. I want my app to worry about backups. That's what Rewind does. I want to provide backups. So Mike took Amazon Lambda and Amazon Simple Q Service, SQS, and he joined them together. And he pointed all of the webhooks for their app at these services. These services then were able to handle all loads and all downtime or uh, sorry, all low latency time, and they could have this great queue ready for them. And their app, Rewind, could then pick jobs off the queue at its own speed. The job of Rewind is now to measure how long things are in the queue and how backlogged things are. They now get to decide when to spin up new servers and exactly how much it's going to cost them to process the current user base they have. It's a great way to manage the load of an app like Rewind. Mike writes in the bottom of his post that in the last month they've processed about 8 million webhooks and it's, it's cost them less than 50 bucks to do so. This is a fantastic win and this is something that everyone who processes webhooks should strongly consider doing. Our fulfillment on capture app, it can benefit from the same strategy. Using Lambda and SQS or similar technologies, we could send all of our webhooks there. We could let all the varying load land in those services and then we could start peeling fulfillment uh, notifications off of that queue at our own speed and guarantee that we deliver every order is captured from our app within a reasonable amount of time. These are just two examples of two areas in Shopify that apps find themselves quite often. There's dragons in there, go slay them. I've given you a few tips and maybe where you'll find one or two of them. Pick your SLOs, pick your battles and focus on those things first. Stack the cards in your favor. It's not impossible to get these wins. Once you've resolved and gotten some of these terrifying nightmarish apps that are successful and you've gotten them a little bit more boring, you should absolutely consider load testing. This is actually really hard to do, but if you can figure out how to do it for your app, because no two apps are the same, if you can figure out how to do it for your app, you should do this. It's way better for you to find the edges in the next series of bottlenecks than waiting for your customers to do this for you. This is something we'd love to figure out how to help you with as well. So if you're trying to figure out how to load test your app and you have a Shopify app that, that is getting a lot of demand, then please reach out to us. You know, let us know how maybe we can help you figure out how to load test your app in the future. People joke about money scale, but it's actually a pretty good strategy, as long as it's a short-term strategy, or maybe if the economics of your, your business model allow it, it maybe is even a good long-term solution. 
But when your app is not quite adopted, it's, you're not sure if it's the right thing. This is, this is actually a great strategy to get you through that life support period, to go in and decide, yes, this is absolutely the right thing. We're going to double down. We're going to spend money on this. Scaling it with some money for a while to make sure that it's, it has all the resources you need. This is, this is absolutely something that you should not feel guilty doing. So your app's nice and boring and stable and it's making you great money. The next thing to do is to think about resiliency patterns. On the internet, everything breaks. Eventually, your app will go down. Something your app depends on will go down. You do not want your users waking you up at two in the morning telling you that your app is down. You need to use tools like PagerDuty to let you know that things are broken. Resiliency patter patterns may fundamentally change parts of your apps. You may need to change the way you depend on external services to make sure that they don't become a throttle on your app. Ideally, you talk in terms of degraded service instead of outages when you start to get to this level. You'll notice that Shopify goes down in, in, in little pieces and not all of Shopify will go down. This is because of our strong resiliency patterns. We'd much rather have a degraded service than a service this is out. These patterns are advanced, so once you have gotten through the initial scaling, this is where you should focus your energy on next. Things will change. You're going to get 1% better. Lean on PagerDuty. Let things know, let, let things tell you when something's broken. Don't let your customers tell you. Just because today things are going great, it doesn't mean that tomorrow one of the biggest plus merchants installs your app and immediately triples your usage. It's going to happen. And you want to know when to scale everything up and you want to know when to spend the money at the right time. Lastly, trust with your customers, trust with our merchants is paramount. Be protective of their data. I'm encouraging you to explore some tooling and help you to understand what your apps are doing and to get signals when things are wrong, but you are responsible for your customer's data. Don't let it go into the wrong place. Make sure that you have good security practices in place and that you, the merchant data that you're sending into other services is safe. So no one's gonna maintain your app for you. Go hunt some dragons, but focus on making it 1% better every day. Our merchants and your customers are going to love you for it. I have a, a link here to Mike's uh, code base that he maintains, which is a sample set of code for Amazon uh, Lambda and SQS. You should go check it out if that's interesting to you. And I'm really sorry we didn't get to do this in person. I would have loved to take a whole bunch of questions, but uh, we'll be able to maybe communicate through email and I can help give you some guidance and feedback if you're having some of these struggles. Thanks. Have a great day.